everyone. Welcome to crayfish.io iStart program. Today is our Q&A session, and we have four experts joining us. So good afternoon to those of you in the UK, and also good evening to those of you dialing in from China. Before we start, just a couple of uh, housekeeping matters. Uh, this Q&A session lasts an hour. And uh, thanks to everyone's input, we have all received over 40 questions. So what we have done is we have grouped these questions and we will talk them through. But if you have any further questions while you uh, listen to the expert uh, going through questions, anytime you can send it through your Q&A tab, which is at the bottom of your screen. And then at the end of this session, if we still have time, we can probably take additional questions. So for those who are new to Crayfish, so my name is Ting Zhang. I'm the founder and CEO of the company. And uh, uh, Crayfish has been around since 2017. And we focus on everything related to with doing business with China, but now also expanding to cover some Asian countries. So for businesses, we provide all kinds of expertise, whether it's market entry strategy or translation or marketing, or it's related to sourcing and supply chain. And for those um, individuals, they can sign up on our platform and provide their services. We have the second strand of our business, which is helping companies to access those important connections in China and in the UK. And of course, we have experts who um, we connect with these uh, individuals, um, particularly through our China Accelerator, as well as uh, I started program. So on the last strand of our main business, this Capital Plus, uh, I mentioned Accelerator program, but we also help with uh, startups and scale-ups. So very quickly on Accelerator, our China Accelerator program is very much um, focusing on deep tech. And we have two partner anchor investors um, who specifically focus on medical device advanced manufacturing, and that is UKCE and also new materials. And we have another investor, EBI, which is focused on semiconductor and IoT we are expanding into a number of new tech areas uh, later this year as well. So watch this space. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our experts for today. We have Terry, and Terry has a very strong capital market background, but also investing in small companies and advising scale-ups as well. And we have Dr. Jian Chao. Jian is a partner of UK, UK China Enterprise Fund, which is our partner in, the, uh, in our China Accelerator. But he has also been running his own businesses um, as well as investing into startups. And Linda, who is entrepreneur, right at the beginning of her career almost, um, and found, co-founded a business in China that was uh, first mobile data analytics, I believe, which was sold to Alibaba. And now she's on her entrepreneur journey again and co-founded a new AI company. Finally, we have Inan. And Inan is still qualified lawyer in both the Chinese law and the UK law. And to me, she's much more than a lawyer. <laughs> Okay, sorry for that. So we have some people who can't join? No, I think the majority of them can't join. Really? Where is that? Um, we are still sharing, right? Yes. Okay, sorry. Okay. I'll, I'll check from the back end. Okay, sorry. sorry for, we have some technical issues um, that uh, our colleague is, is uh, sorting out. So do bear with us if you have any um, problems and do let us know through the um, crayfish.io WeChat account. 
so let's start at our first session of uh, the questions. So we have, as I mentioned, we received a lot of questions and, uh, and it's impossible to go through them one by one. But what we have done is look at the common themes of these questions and group them into four. That is starting of your businesses and then um, financing and legal as well as uh, running a business. So all our experts have the experience in all these four areas. Uh, but for the time uh, limits, so we will have a kind of discussion and um, some of these are more relevant to one speaker than another. So for starting up the business, I think I would like to talk to Linda first, because I mentioned, Linda, you, you co-founded a very um, successful startup and now you co-founded another startup. So perhaps you could tell us from your experience, what are the most important things, um, three things in setting up a, a startup and also the, the traps as well. Hello, Linda, can you? Sorry, we seem to have a little bit um, technical problem. We can't hear Linda. So perhaps, you know, would you like to comment on this one first or? Just on the attendees, I know also they're trying to sort out some attendees are also struggling to join. So give us two minutes, we'll just quickly check that and so maybe we can resume. Okay, now we're back. Sorry, I think uh, our office network is not very stable today for some reason, which, is, uh, which doesn't usually happen. So carry on. Um, okay. How about can we do that? Okay, you we can do it from. Can I say that now? Uh, hi, Linda. Hi, we're back. Um, I'm sorry for the tech problem we have. Seems to be the internet connection in our office building today. Uh, can Linda hear me? Can you carry on? Uh, yeah, I can hear now. So. Okay. Uh, I where where we are now. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't hear what you said before. Yeah. Okay. So I've passed the posting to oh. um to um to Inan. Can you see the screen? So let me just uh, share the screen again. Okay. Sure. Um. Can you share the screen from yours? Because I. Yes, from on the uh, slides. Can you share screen? Well, uh, Linda, maybe we can just carry on talking. I think I just started just now, but because I dropped out, I missed out uh, where you were talking. So could you just... Um, we haven't started. We haven't. So let's just start I see that. now. Okay, yeah. so let's just uh, start talking about the, the three most important things when you set up a startup. Uh, yeah, I think this is a, a very, very good question. I think um, um, it's very difficult to pick up three things. There's so many things uh, you need to do and uh, there's so many things could go wrong at the beginning. But I think, uh, I think actually there's, I think there's three very important things actually before you start your startup, you need to think about this. I mean, um, for me, I mean, from my experience, I, I think they are very, very important. I think the first thing you need to think about 
before you actually do decide that you're going to do that startup, you need to really think about what kind of problem you try to address, your problem you try to solve. So because there, you know, there's so many times we have an idea about something, we say, oh, we want to change the world, we have a fantastic product idea, we have a fantastic idea to do something, and without really to think through what is the problem? What's the problem you try to solve? Is this a real problem in the world? I mean, that's, that's actually, most startups fail because they actually haven't really think about the problem properly. So I think that's number one most important thing, actually before you're doing your startup. I think the second thing is to really to uh, be able to kind of validate your, your, your idea. I mean, you, you probably identify a small problem and then you need really to talk to people try to validate that idea is work or that that kind of proposition is work like you probably have a saying yeah there's really a big problem in the market but would people will pay to to pay a product to solve the problem sometimes it probably not people because the problem you try to solve for them the money you save for them is not really you know what's for them to pay or you have to change how their business flow for them to do something so i think it's very important to really talk to as many people as possible to validate your your idea validate your proposition i think that the third important thing is is before you do anything you should be able to sell your idea to other people like um you need to convince someone to get someone uh, in line with you because this is very important when you set up your company you need to find you need to build your team you need to find the investors you need to you know, find your customers. So you'd be able to be able to sell your idea to really kind of to uh, structure your idea properly and then to start to try to sell your idea. I think there's actually three things is that you should do very important before you actually set up your company or before you make the decision say, you know, that's the thing I'm going to commit my five years or something to working on. So I think that's three most important things. And uh, um, also, I think there's a question to ask, can, you know, what could be the big trap when you set up your company? I think um, that's also a very, very interesting question because uh, particularly if you haven't done startup before, so there's lots of trap in the, in, the, in the market. I mean, even in different things, like um, you probably couldn't find a radical founder. You probably uh, didn't find the, couldn't find the right investor, all kinds of things. But I think, uh, um, I think the biggest trap a lot of startups actually uh, fall into, particularly in very early stage, is to dilute your share so quickly in very early at the beginning. So uh, if you want to do your startup, you should be really confident about what you, your journey, determining determine what you want to do. But you try, you know, not really just quickly give up everything of the company, even like a big chunk of the share to any angel investor, early stage investor, then, you know, you'll be finding very difficult in the later down the line. And then there's a lot of problem around that. So I think that's kind of just very kind of something top in my head. I'm sure there's lots of discussion we can go around there, particularly for particularly industry, particularly per problem you try to solve, particularly product you try to build. I mean, you know, we could discuss this in uh, in the you know, further session to go really detail, particularly on the problem you try to solve, we can we can do kind of detail analysis on that. Yeah. Okay. I hope that uh, answers the question. Yeah. Yes. Yes. That that's great. Um, I was also. Um, I think we people also wanted to understand your own experience. Hello? Hello? Uh, can you hear me? Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah, so people also like to hear your best experience in starting up your business and uh, and then your worst. Yeah, I think uh, um, being startup, I think the most exciting thing is actually you build something and you feel that kind of like, um, that kind of like, a, you know, the satisfaction when actually you get a customer to use them. And then you get like a really positive feedback. Even negative feedback sometimes is very exciting as well. I mean, my personal experience, for example, when I did my last startup at Yumon, when we first reached our big milestone, which we reached about you know a million customers, I can we 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 tracking. And I think for that point, actually, we really feel like we achieved something, which is something in our like in our dream we think we should we could do it but nobody actually know how to do it and eventually we made it 
And then we got so much positive feedback from customers and they kind of, you know, and they also sometimes criticism about our product to say, oh, maybe you should do that. Maybe you should do another way. So I think it's just kind of like, um, or I think, uh, and I think, uh, I mean, my personal experience, the worst things, I think worst the things like, uh, um, I mean, you constantly on this, you know, um, kind of, you probably always on stress, you probably, because you don't really know exactly what your destiny is. But I think the worst thing actually is you really struggle when you actually don't have, particularly in early stage, you couldn't find the product market fit. So it's like you, you try to do something which like uh, you don't really have no idea when you'll get there. I think when you're actually going to the girl stage, actually easy. But the worst thing I think is actually in the beginning. It's like we work, the whole team worked really hard, but we just don't know when we get there. We have a face we can do, but we just really don't know sometimes. So I think that's kind of, uh, I don't think it's the worst experience, but I also think that's experience. I think every experience in startup, they are exciting. There's sometimes it's very cheerful, sometimes it's stressful, but I think that makes the life being an entrepreneur, right? So it's like you, you, you really don't know what's going to happen tomorrow or next day. But I think that's kind of, uh, I think I think my personal experience around that is, is it just about, you know, you sometimes just like keep the flow, let it go, carry on, and then eventually you'll figure out something. But eventually maybe not, then you have to accept and yeah, you probably made a mistake, then you pivot to another direction. So I think that's kind of, um, you know, experience day-to-day -day life, like um, you, you have to just quickly change every day, everything, I'll, you know, even sometimes quickly pivot, and then, but when you reach a milestone or reach a significant, you know, big like a milestone, you actually feel great. Also, I think being startup, the most ex exciting thing is actually working with the fantastic people because you create your team, you build your team together and the people working together to achieve a goal. So I think that's, that kind of like a experience are very exciting. And particularly, right, if a, a foreign company going to, to see the Chinese investor, I think it's a very good thing to show that what kind of uh, connections. Uh, do you have like a, a, a internship or a one year the experience in, in whatever the, that can connect you to that particular, if you're talking about the Chinese uh, investor, right, they will always like to to after the meeting, right, to see if there's anything that can recommend or anybody that they they know through through a mutual uh, introduction or industry to get to cross reference to to check your background. So this is a, a a good thing, right, to investigate or just at least uh, as a minimum to link up to know a few names, either in the industry or when you're seeing an uh, investor, which is a, a big institute, like uh, for is it like a Chinese. Um, uh, SOE, the, those uh, government officials. So those names, right, will be uh, in particularly useful if if you're seeing some Chinese investor. Uh, Don Chao, anything to add? Uh, yes, my experience when talking to Chinese investor uh, is that we need to uh, firstly demonstrate business, uh, which has a big potential market in China, and also the right trend for current market development in China. Uh, this is quite important that, that can, uh, this is one kind of uh, risk management for the investor. Uh, and secondly, the, uh, be open-minded and flexible. Uh, should have a couple of open option deals in mind. We uh, had a couple of deal with Chinese investor. When we comparison the Final deal uh, with the uh, initial proposal, they're quite uh, completely different. Mm, and the, the finally, also, we need a response as fast, as quickly as possible. Some of the deal will go very quickly. Uh, we had one example uh, with Chinese investor. From the beginning of the pitch to money coming to the company uh, is within 10 days. That's why sometimes go very fast. Sometimes uh, it's a bit slow, it has take a longer time, uh, more than six months to close the deal. But I think uh, um, response quickly is uh, uh, very important. Yes, I, I add a bit of my personal experience, like uh, in, in last year that I approached a, a field, a new startup company, UK in, in here, uh, at Oxford, London or Cambridge. And then on the other side, right, I link up with uh, some Chinese uh, potential investor. 
But funny enough, I, I feel the difference in the communication method because we, uh, I was in, in Hong Kong, China for over 30 years, right? So I'm so used to, to the WeChat or even WhatsApp. But here more often, right, they only replied in email, which will slow down the communication pro progress. So I often make it as quick as possible, no matter if whatever way it is. So nowadays, right, it's, it's very easy to use this uh, uh, platform, uh, WeChat or WhatsApp instead of email. So the speed is, is one of the very important area that to, look, to look out for. Yes, um, I'm back. And I'm sorry for the technical problems just now we sorted out. So um, for the financing, we can see there's uh, many, many questions and we can actually carry on talking for a lot more. Uh, but we've got a number of other uh, parts of the question to, to still go through. But just on the uh, work with Chinese investor, from my experience of helping startup access Chinese backed funding, um, I have found that um, many of the times the Chinese investor would like to ask exclusivity in terms of IP rights for China and also sometimes uh, distribution rights uh, and in other cases setting up a joint venture in China. This is actually also a less risky way to get into the Chinese market um, as long as your interest and the investor's interest are aligned uh, in that the, the investor is not actually going to uh, be competing with some of other your target customers, for example. So um, let's move on. I think we have also uh, uh, some legal questions uh, coming through as well. And uh, so I will uh, probably uh, pass it on to uh, Inan now. So Inan, I think people are really interested in top three legal advice to start with. Yeah, I mean, obviously, ideally, I could go through and maybe give you the top 10, but uh, given the time, give you the top three uh, most obvious ones that I can think of. Um, the first one I would say is always ask yourself what happens when things go pear shaped. Because as human beings, we tend to obviously do things based on what you can see now, what you expect to happen in the future is also based on your judgment now. So at the start of this journey, I'm sure you'll be feeling very energetic, optimistic, and relationships are generally great with your co-founders and core teams and so on and so forth. So while well, this may be the case, you should always pre be prepared for rainy days. So it is common to have you know, founders at the start of the, uh, of the business to loan some money to the company, for example. From the company's perspective, you would want some paperwork so that you get certainty the founder can't just ask for the money back at any time. If there is investment come in, if the investment want to qualify for SEIS, for example, then it can't be used to pay back the founder's loan. And equally for the founder, if you don't want this not to be recognized or in the future there's any dispute of getting your money back and when you can get your money back, you at least want it to be documented. At the start of the business also, that's when your IP is really being created, the products are being designed and developed, so it's important to you know, make sure it's clear who owns the IP right. Um, generally, obviously, the company should own the IP right, so you need IP assignment. Just because you pay somebody to design it, a third-party service provider, don't think you own it. You probably just get the right to use it. So make sure you know these are the important things to look at. So always think, what if things go wrong? If everybody's happy, then there's no dispute. That's not a problem. Everybody's on the same page. Um, Everybody's heard of obviously the story with the uh, Facebook co-founder. That's one of the most well-known ones, where he was massively diluted and ultimately pushed out. That's because he didn't have a good document protecting his interest. I have recently had to document a 50-50 uh, sort of handshake agreement between two founders. When at that point the company is already worth a hundred million. Luckily for them, they're still you know they, they still have a good relationship. They want to honor that agreement even though legally one founder actually holds four times more share than the other founder, but they're going to honor that original handshake agreement. But imagine if the relationship does fall apart, then it will be very difficult for the other founder to retract the steps. Um, also, you know, we, we, I've seen situations where at the start of the journey, maybe there are four founders, um, later on one of them no longer make that kind of level of this, um, contribution. So the other three things, you know, he should no longer be an equal partner. But what do you do if you haven't got a founder agreement at the start? It is very, with a reverse, you know, vesting mechanism or something similar, it is very difficult then to just kick someone out. 
if you want to buy them out, you know, if what if they demand a very unreasonable price? Um, there are ways, of course, to get around it, but it has, needs to be handled really carefully. So, as I was saying, you know, first and foremost, always think about what if things goes wrong, and then um, you know you can probably help to prevent a lot of this from going wrong later on. And then, secondly, I would. Uh, say, you know, get it right from the start, plan for the long term, of course, without sacrificing your short term goals. Understandably, uh, start up at the beginning of their journey, you have a million things to do, but you have very limited resources and funding. So you need to prioritize, you work out a plan, what you need to do, what other things can wait and you weigh out in terms of risk and benefit. Um, of course, you can only take measures that you can afford, but also commensurate with the size of your business and the risk level. But it's definitely worth thinking about things like, for example, if you think, is this going to be a national business or international business model? Where should you incorporate the company? Because once you're incorporated, you set it up, everything goes under that, and then it would become quite difficult to change or to add companies on top. So we think it through if where are your shareholders likely to be, where are your customers are likely to be, where your revenue is going to be from, where is your cost center? For example, if you've got tech team based in China or in India developing softwares, but you have your sales team mainly in the UK, you have two co-founders, one's based in the UK, one's based in China, it's definitely worth spending time working out what the best setup for you. Should you set up a UK hold call with a Chinese subsidiary or the other way around? You should look at maybe, do you need it? Maybe you think, okay, maybe set up something up in Hong Kong because you're selling everything you know, online in terms of you know, uh, sort of, um, there isn't a specific um, a place that you say that's your main place of business from a tax perspective that perhaps could be a lot more advantageous. It's just something you've got to think it through at the start and make sure you're set up right. Because I've worked with companies where uh, when they were raising around 600,000, they ended up spending 100,000 on, on legal fees with a law firm because they had to change structures to accommodate what the investors' requirements are and from something that was probably messed up previously. So these are the type of things. It's important to get it right at the start. It probably won't cost a huge amount of money if you get it right at the start. Um, and, and some other stuff, maybe you think you can wait. You don't need a state of art articles, associations, or shareholder agreement when you don't have that many shareholders or just fund co-founders and, and some friends and family money. So you basically prioritize it, but plan for the long term get right in the start from the start and lastly i'll just quickly uh, touch on is um and something actually linda mentioned earlier as well don't relinquish control too early but it's a balance because you don't want to hold on to too dearly either when the time is right to get external help so it is a balance um, one of the questions that was asked um was do you see examples of companies successfully scale up without bringing in vc in the early days? And the answer is yes, I've invested in and also worked with companies who bootstrapped it for a long time until the valuation is in the tens of millions. Uh, but equally, you probably see a lot more funders who relinquish control too soon and later on uh, regret, uh, as Linda said. I mean, we can probably talk through the examples later on if there's time. Um, but what I would say is um, early stage companies, it's, you, you, you need to be resourceful. As um, Terry and Dr. Tao were saying earlier, you look at government grants, accelerate programs, angel investors. Um, vast majority of early stage investment in the UK market for startups you know, before sort of going to Series A are actually done by individuals that, that are, can enjoy the SEIS, EIS tax relief. If you don't know what those are, you can quickly Google it, HMRC, SEIS. UK government rolled out these tax uh, incentive schemes to, to make it attractive to invest in early stage companies. So high net worth individuals get um, very, very good tax relief if uh, they make investment based on these schemes. So majority of the UK startups, um, vast majority of UK startups actually qualify for the scheme and do utilize that. That would be probably your you know, best chance of getting individual friends and family investors at the at early stage. And that will probably get you through for a very long period of time if we need to, you know, raise from institutional investors. Mm. 
that, that's very, very helpful. I do uh, echo very much uh, your point about getting things right, right at the beginning, because later when you change, it's really uh, cost a lot of money, but also uh, causing um, emotional um, implication as well. Uh, so I, I think you already talked about the shares and mentioned options. Um, I, I think there's questions uh, asking more specifically about how do you uh, use those options and uh, how do you use them uh, to, to incentivize the team, but also avoid the future uh, conflicts. I wonder whether you can just quickly also touch on, on that. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, this is to be distinguished from what I was talking about earlier in terms of founder shares, because, you know, the, in the founder agreement, what you agree is, look, if the company takes off, what kind of, what contribution would be each made and, and how long do we need to stay in the company for us to really each get whatever percentage of share of the company we think we should be getting. And reverse vesting in that sense is if you were given 40% of the company, but you end up only staying for two years, maybe you need to give half of the back. It's that kind of conversation you need to have. Um, in terms of employee sort of incentive schemes, um, you know, this is very commonly used to incentivize key employees, but also it's a very useful tool for early stage startups because some of the, um, you, you can attract talents without having to pay them, as it were, the market rate because they believe in your idea, they believe in the company, and that's why, you know, they take the, the equity incentives as part of the compensation. So it's a very useful tool. And uh, there are, you know, um, I think everybody's very familiar probably with the EMI, that's the most tax efficient um, employee incentive schemes. Um, if you were to look up to, to set up one, I would always recommend that's where you start. Most companies, again, would qualify only specific industries, don't qualify. Um, and that's the first place to look. To set it up, you, um, you, you, I would say three things. Advanced planning, think about anti-dilution, think about tax efficiency. What I mean by that, you always plan in advance in that you need to look at what size do you want to set, what size of the pool, the option pool you want to set aside for employee incentives. Because um, you, once you get investors in, they, they sometimes want to veto when you, you know, allocate more for, for, because then they will be diluted. Um, or sometimes it becomes more difficult uh, when the valuation changes, so on and so forth. So you always look at, okay, whether it's 10%, 20%, that's the pool you're setting aside. But also you need to, when you're allocating and when you're issuing these options, don't just promise the world away to the first person you see, because you've got to think, when I build a team over time, I can't afford to have the whole suite of, you know, C-suite now, COO, CTO, CFO, but you've got to make sure you save those set aside because I've seen lots of companies by the time they have somebody who it's very important for them, they run out of the option pool. Then they go back to the shareholders. Of course, you know, there's always a conversation to be had, but it's a lot more hustle and also potentially could affect your valuation if you're doing a fundraising round where investors are just saying, well, that because you just work out the numbers, right? They'd be further diluted and therefore. So that's just something, you know, to, to make sure you plan ahead and think about dilution point because that's also dilution, obviously, for the founders themselves. And tax efficiency, um, as I was mentioned earlier, you know, there's the EMI, there's the gross share, there's, you know, a variety of schemes you can look at. Always look for the most tax efficient way, of course, but do not promise your employees you would definitely qualify or that's what you're giving them. I've seen companies with situation where they hire someone and that's promised to be an EMI scheme, but turned out the company doesn't qualify. Therefore, the employee did a whole Excel spreadsheet and modeling to show <laughs> he would have been entitled to this much with the tax advantage if the company exit at 100 million value, he would be entitled to, let's say, eight, 8 million. Because it's no longer tax efficient, he now wants, I don't know, 14 million equivalent. So don't promise something you don't know whether you're definitely gonna get, but what you can say is, we're gonna set up whatever that's possible the most tax, in te most tax efficient way, and we will give you, you know, say by percentage or by number of shares, this number of options. And that's the easiest way for the company to manage that. 
Yes, I agree. Again, uh, from my own experience, uh, having your legal advisor and tax advisor working very closely is very important to ensure that you achieve the best tax efficiency. And I hope all the uh, audience have making quick notes um, of all, all the important uh, points in I mentioned because all this legal advice yeah. would cost you a lot of money. <laughs> I would actually was just going to add because the, in the question, obviously, other than setting up a scheme, they also mentioned how do you avoid future conflict. I mean, look like anything, how do you avoid future conflict is to be clear, be transparent from the start, but also get it documented. And these employee incentive schemes, they have pretty standard scheme rules, there is market practice. But generally, the things that are tricky, you know, Linda knows this, because we've been talking about that. Um, you have your typical good lever, bad lever definitions and some are very poorly drafted some are circular and then you end up going when you're leaving you don't know what, what you're entitled to what you're supposed to or not supposed to be giving back and and you typically would say bad leavers you define them as uh people being dismissed for gross misconduct or fraud and maybe everybody else is good lever or the other way around depending you know whether it's more in favor of the company or more in favor of the employee if you want to be fair you also look through the situation where for example if the employee is forced lever because they have contributed their time in the early stage help the to build up the company if they're some, somehow forced out but then they have to give back the option or they have to give back the shares that would seem unfair you create a moral hazard there there's almost incentive to push them out so it's important to define what each category of situation leaving is and then you define generally you would lose everything that's invested of course because that's just time hasn't you haven't made that contribution to earn that but for things that's vested if you are a good lever or forced lever you should be able to keep them and then some companies they prefer to buy you know there's compulsory transfer you have to give, sell the shares basically to other shareholders at fair market value so you cash in you as it were or you exit at that point but for some employees they might feel if i'm forced out i actually lose the future potential upside so that's not fair either so these are sort of the little, um, I, su I suppose, small subtleties in these scheme rules, either from an employee perspective or from a company's perspective. It's just important to get it clear in everybody's head and it's transparent. There's no, you know, a fixed formula, but these would be your typical things to look out for, to make sure it's clear to avoid future conflict. Yes, thank you very much, Inan. I think for any startup, uh, legal matters are really important. And it, it's all the time that you need to make sure you did you do the right things and also speak to the right advice as well. And uh, for my experience, I think uh, uh, if you just uh, don't go for any typical lawyer who just uh, charge you by the minutes and then just do your documents, you need to find someone who actually understands your business, who can then see the perspective with uh, not just the legal side, but the business side. So on that, I think we talk about a lot of the important aspects of uh, fundraising and legal aspect, but running a business, we're also receiving some questions about finding partners and business model. And uh, so we haven't got a lot of time left, but I would like we cover this very quickly as well. I think perhaps um, Dr. Chow, you would like to comment first as you you have run your own business, but you've also been an investor and particularly in technology. So would you like to quickly talk through this or maybe just combining them together rather than one one by one question because we, we are running short of time because uh, earlier technical problems. Okay, yeah, yeah, because uh, we got a lot of questions probably we just uh, there's a couple of questions here, uh, which is popular, uh, most popular, and uh, Linda will be listening to answer some of the questions. So uh, first, to evaluate a company, uh, especially early stage startup, I think it most of it's more of a, an art rather than financial calculation. Uh, it is a crucial part for any startup at uh, this stage because uh, it is normally difficult to predict the right uh, future cash flow figure. The valuation company mainly subjected to a number of key factors. Uh, first, uh, how strong the IP position is. Uh, what's your IP uh, ownership? What's your IP um, uh, pattern families? All these questions need to prepare. And how big your target market perception is. 
because uh, this um, all the the, cal the calculation of the company is uh, depend on the, how the size of the market, potential market, and also the route to the market. How the how big the market you can access, and also how good your current performance and the future projections are. This is also uh, very important, uh, and also the current cash flow. For example, if uh, I'm shortly going to run out of cash. The company uh, might be devaluated. So uh, finally, a proven management team uh, with a good uh, strategic direction. Uh, it is particularly important for how confidently the investor will pay. If uh, there is a lack of uh, a good track record team, you may need to bring suitable partner in to add value. This is the question about uh, how to find uh, suitable partners. To get a suitable partner, you need to uh, uh, share your ideas to sell your dream to uh, with your also share your passion. A good business plan to check potential partners, uh, plus probably offering attractive uh, shares or options, etc. Uh, I think you should find a suitable person through your uh, all personal connections, uh, the people who you are worked with or familiar with, uh, or uh, if you can't do that, uh, probably can help from uh, professional networks. Uh, so Linda, would you like to end some of the point here? Uh, yeah, sure. So uh, the second question to ask about, um, I mean, B2C and B2B. So basically, you, you are, uh, you, is your customer uh, enterprise or is your customer actually are consumers um is it good uh, is it good to do to b and to say at the same time um it's going to be very challenge because it depends on what product you're building if you're building a product you have your customer uh, you basically have to define your customer first so if you do an enterprise customer that what the problem you try to solve is a consumer customer with problem you try to solve so you could have one product and use B2B and B2C as a different uh, channel to do your user acquisition. But um, I wouldn't say one product can fade out because you actually have a different problem you try to try to addressing or different uh, problem you try to solve, so which you actually need to probably need to build a different product. But it's very common, uh, particularly in the UK, a model actually is to be today B2B to C, which is a consumer product, but you you partner with the a corporate and then to basically serve their customer which is the go to market strategy so uh, that's actually quite common particularly for the b2c customer a b2c company in the uk uh it's less common in in china because china has a like a huge uh you know the market is huge and the, the user is huge so people less less start up doing that way um i think uh, the final one is what's the perception on key area of collaboration? And I think there's so many areas going to be collaborated and uh, you know, most obviously going to be the medical science <laughs> because that's like, that's something particularly around the uh, COVID-19 pandemic area. And another area actually, there's a lot of collaboration already been working on is all the artificial intelligence in the general from deep tech technology to the, uh, to the market use case, et cetera. And also I think there's a gradual trends like more and more Chinese company actually, uh, you know, hugely invest in the international market, like TikTok, for example, and they actually have a huge center in London, the R&D center. Huawei has a big R&D AI center in London. So there's actually growing trends and more and more Chinese tech company. And then they come to UK and then set up like a, you know, technology, R&D center at base because we have so much good talent in the UK and then we should to as a center to actually expand their international business. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think the uh, B2B and B2C model uh, has a lot of in common, but also have uh, many differences. Um, I think it's a, it is a different decision making approach because uh, the B2C is targeting customer directly who can who are interested in your product involve a short decision process. But B2B is uh, pitching decision makers in a small group or big organization. It might involve a longer marketing campaign. That would be conduct a lot of research on your company, uh, your product, your 
market validation, um, also their own uh, capability and budget, et cetera. It's a different um, motivation for the B2C customer immediately see benefit from uh, moving the, improving their lives. But the B2B clients are looking for their business to benefit. Uh, also, it's a different relationship. Uh, but the B2C is driving short term value, need less time spent. Uh, but a very good customer care, of course, is very important. Uh, B2B uh, is a build a longer term relationships. And also that uh, the difference is um, of the branding experience exercise is different because the branding of B2C is uh, focused on awareness of your company as product, but B2B concentrate on leads generation. Uh, I believe there's no way to scale up your business with a B2C model. But the B2C is necessary at the beginning of your business to understand the market and the customer behavior, to learn how the market works, how your product fits the customers. Mm -hmm. After that, you can just work with the channels to scale up. Uh, just to give a, one example, because one of our investor company, uh, I think a couple of years ago, developed a product the first product to the, the first UK market. So that prepared uh, sell the product in three phases. And the first phase, they trial their product as many as uh, they can to get customer feedbacks. Then uh, they can finalize the product. Then they started to uh, um, be to see model to sell, which is a uh, hundred unit level to their early uh, adopters in the first year. So they're called, uh, uh, they're so called uh, ambassador for the product. So once they had uh, market validation, they started to approach a small distributors, channels, and some of the uh, clinics to at the second phase to continue sell both directed and indirectly to, but still in small volume. When they further approved the market, now they started to switch the sale model to B2B model, which is engaging with a big organization uh, in different marketplaces. It will be in level of 10,000 or 20,000 unit order. So this is the difference between the B2B and the B2C. Uh, and just to end uh, some of the comment for uh, the last question uh, Linda just mentioned for what's the area to collaboration of between China and the UK. Uh, I think in the short term, um, there has been some restrictions on technology collaboration between the UK and China, especially influenced by the difficulties between US and China. But in the longer term, it's a wide world will not break. Once everybody comes down a bit, it will scale up. Uh, because don't forget, at the moment, only about 3% of the UK international trade is with China. The UK is mainly providing technology and service to the world. But China in the past was more driven by um, building infrastructures and manufacturing capacity through buying product, production lines, equipment, etc. But now, the China is looking to upgrade the fundamental technology. So it is a, a good opportunity for technology collaboration. Uh, this I believe, uh, especially after the impact of uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, the life sciences is uh, definitely one of the key area. More funding and support will encourage in improving people's lives. I think that's, that's all from me. That's great. Um, yes, indeed, uh, life science uh, has been one of the sectors that's, that's actually uh, has fair wear of the in the pandemic has seen a huge growth uh, of investment uh, in China, I believe, and uh, and in the UK as well. So um, I think uh, with this, the the, the sort of uh, questions uh, that were previously submitted are more or less cleared. Um, we have uh, probably don't have time today to take any more questions, but we are having a future work series where we can 
tackle each of these uh, areas in much more uh, depth, uh, deep um, details, and also you can have more interaction as well. So on that, I would like to do a quick polling um, for everyone to see if um, you would like to attend any of this, and uh, and you can choose more than one. So please, if you could, um, on your screen uh, to do um, to submit the poll, so we can see, and then we can then develop this for you uh, with your interest. So we have four starting up. 101 is basically everything you need to uh, think and do for your starting up, pretty much like we discussed today briefly in the first session. And then we have the fundraising, which we will talk through more detail about what type of re uh, funds and runs and also what type of investors and how you engage with the investors uh, and including how you do a business plan. And on business strategy, this is really uh, looking at uh, you know, your business model, your product positioning, your marketing strategy, and, uh, and how you uh, sort of looking at your companies in a longer uh, term in terms of the growth uh, for the coming years. And finally, there's always um, a lot of um, things you need to learn about how you structure a company a beginning, but also along the way. And there's the legal plus tax and other commercial issues you needed to be aware. So all this we can then um, deal with them in detail in the uh, coming up uh, workshop series. So we can see um, people are already making uh, some of the polls. So I'm going to close the poll in about 10 seconds. So if uh, anyone uh, has not done that, please uh, do that very quickly. Right, so I think uh, we have further chance to interact and uh, to get more feedback later through our WeChat group and also later through email. So I'm gonna end the poll now. So we will see you later. And uh, do let us know your feedback through contacting us as well. Right, so um, just on this one, uh, sorry, I just needed to close the poll. Right, so here we previously said uh, more questions, but I don't think we have time now. Um, we, what we will do is we'll come back to you with the answers. If you have asked for questions, I can see a couple uh, of them, but we will contact you after that. Just to quickly, we do have a uh, event uh, coming up on the 16th, which is about supply chain strategy. And if you're interested, you can go to our website or you will probably also learn that from our social media and WeChat as well. So uh, with that, I would like to thank again all our expert today for your time and for sharing your insight and of, uh, to the audience for uh, attending and for bearing with us the tech problem we had early on. And the video will be the video link will be sent to you after uh, we edit it to get rid of the, um, the interruption bit. So that hopefully will be sent to you tomorrow. And, um, and you can carry on interacting with us through uh, the channel you used before, whether it's WeChat or email or LinkedIn. Thank you very much again uh, and uh, have a good afternoon. Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye.